So thank, thank you very much for the introduction, Alan, and uh, it's very kind of you to, to welcome me this evening. Uh, and also thank you to Gavin McDowell, who I think over a year ago now, before lockdown, um, originally suggested that I come along and uh, speak to the, the society. Can everybody see my screen okay, first of all? Um, it, sh it should be two, two big images, one in, on the left-hand side that says the Fisher Harbour and Seafront Association, and uh, on the right-hand side, the second part of the talk this evening is the, the Sloifa, which was our cruise to Norway. Perfect. So first, first of all, I would like to talk say, about, about the Fisher Harbour and Seafront Association. Um, the, why, why this association was formed, um, what, what is it that we have been doing since formation, and what do we see um, the, the future holding for us? The Harbour Users Group, if we go way back, was formed, I believe, um, it's, it's steeped in history, um, around about the time when East Lothian Council became responsible for the Harbour. The Harbour Users Group was chaired by the incumbent councillor, councillor, um, former councillor Turner, I saw on the call earlier and will recall um, vividly the, the meetings of the, the Harbour Users Group. Um, we had, had challenges, I would say, um, through the time of the Harbour Users Group and at least the meetings that I went to. Um, I think it was um, somehow quite difficult to get the various different groups that use the Harbour to come onto the same page and agree what it was that they wanted to see done, which in turn made it difficult for the council to invest in any particular thing that, that pleased all the stakeholders. To cut a long story short, I think 40 years passed with very little um, investment or visible change at the harbour. And if we come up to more current times, and around about the last 10 years, local area planning came about and the Musselburgh Area Partnership was formed. And that in turn gave rise to the Fisherow Waterfront Group that was formed as a, a, a charitable org organization um, to consult with um, locals as to what they wanted to see done with the seafront. But that excluded completely the Harbour uh, User Group that ran on in parallel at that time. Then eventually in 2017, we came together and Campbell McRae, McRae Associates were um, commissioned to do a feasibility study for the whole area, looking at the harbour and the seafront together to come up with a recommendation of what we could do. And that led to a recommendation um, to form a trust association at that time, um, very much modelled on the North Berwick um, Harbour Trust Association that work in the same, you know, the, the same local authority, um, and hence that it was felt to be a good idea to, to model what we were doing at Fisherow on on the, the North Berwick model. A seafront steering group was put together um, under the um, leadership of uh, David Wilkie as the chair, and we brought together all the interested parties and wanting to know what it was that we were getting involved in. The Common Goods kindly funded um, a survey to be done on the harbour. And Arch Henderson ran that survey in February 2018. Um, and then round about that time as well, the, the, the harbour was confirmed as a common good asset. And there was always a, a great deal of um, question around who actually owned the harbour. But eventually um, it was confirmed that it was a common good asset. And then in 2018, the Harbour and Seafront Association was formed. At that point, that, that brought together the waterfront groups, all the good work that the waterfront group had been doing, it, it came together under the umbrella of the Harbour and Seafront Association. And we moved on to become constituted as a charitable organisation as well. And we formed a management agreement with East Lothian Council in the same way that North Berwick have. So the two associations have got responsibility for each harbour work, working in, in conjunction with East Lothian Council. And just uh, you know, in brief, the, the scope of the um, responsibility covers um, the seafront from the, uh, the Maggie Burn, if you're from Musselburgh, the Brunston Burn, if you're from Edinburgh, we had that conversation mm -hmm. earlier, <laughs> um, down to the mouth of the Esk, um, the north side of the links, along the seafront, and the whole harbour area, including the land behind. 
Um, and the, the management agreement is published, it's signed, um, and it's published on the, the FHSA website that was linked in this, this presentation. And through that management agreement, the, the, the Harbin Seafront Association forms that umbrella um, and has member groups from the Sea Cadets to the Yacht Club, the Rowing Club, um, the Berth Holders Association, the Waterfront Group, as I mentioned, and we also enjoy the um, participation from the Community Council and the Area Partnership. So what is it we're, we're set out to do? It, it's all about realising the potential of the harbour um, as a common good asset for the benefit of the community. And we, we talk about economic and social, but generally just promoting activity around about the harbour. And I'll go on to talk about what that activity um, involves and anybody who walks by the harbour will, will, will know what it is and it won't be new, new information but I think it's good just to reflect on what we actually have in our community that we're trying to make the most of. So the next slide is just walk through you know the various groups that make use of the harbour. So the, the Yacht Club have been sailing here since 1957. Um, they're now a nationally recognised training centre by the Royal um, Yachting Association and can teach powerboating and dinghy sailing. Um, the yacht sailing is, is always a bit of a spectacle. This is a uh, Dave Wilkie, our chair, clearly over the line. Um, you know, that, that's the start line there, that's the start flag. So we have photographic evidence that he made a false start, which is always good because I was on the other boat. And then the, the annual crane out is always a bit of a, a spectacle that um, some members here, I see Dave Monaghan on the call, he's um, always around when the, the, the crane operation is happening, um, which is essential for the safety of the boats, but it also creates a, a bit of a focal point around the harbour on, on those days. The Sea Cadets, I saw Carol Cleghorn there, who's always you know, been very active in the Sea Cadets. And you know, the, the unit exists in South Street in, in Musselburgh. Um, and it, they're a very active core with, I think, currently two rowing boats, six dinghies and, and two motor boats to, to help the cadets get out in the water at Fish Row. And the rowing club, um, two skiffs that were built in the community um, are, are very active, um, or at least were before lockdown, um, and, and have you know, rowed a lot at Fisher Row, um, but also across Scotland. At a high, higher speed, we've also had national success and international success in powerboating. Um, water ski racing has um, long been a um, activity at Fisher Row. It's actually the thing that got me, first of all, out in the water as we mentioned, um, and that, that continues today with, with training at Fish Row. The promenade itself is used for you know, multiple reasons, as well as walking, the, the athletics club um, often have a race along the promenade, and it's used by groups, for example, you know, cycling with the aged trishaws. Um, I've, I've got a, a recognised route along the promenade to the harbour, to the mussel shell um, that's, that's, that's predetermined for, and, and has, has had a, a risk assessment done. The, the annual Family Fund Day um, was, was a, a, a huge success where you know, loads of folk came down and enjoyed um, sandcastle building, stalls and so on. Um, the honest line in Alaska out in the fishing boat um, there was the, the raft race, tug of war competition, you know, just general activity on the beach is, was, was fantastic to see. Um, and then we had a, a, a festival day at the harbour um, at the start of 2019 um, that really helped to um, envision what the harbour could be like rather than just a car park. Could it be this kind of social hub where people come together um, around the harbour? And actually make use of it as a, a an amenity um, for for social gatherings. In terms of celebrating the the, you know, the, the heritage of the harbour, um, there's there's a lot of activity. This wasn't the association itself, but it's, it's important to recognise the um, in this case the, the fish waste video that we saw during the ride of the marches. That there's a you know, there's a, a, a long heritage at, at Fish Row with um, fishing. Um, and, and the interpretation boards that were put up, I think it was a waterfront group that commissioned those, um, help anyone who's visiting the area to, to you know, understand what, what has gone before. And the, as well as interpretation boards, the, anyone walking by the harbour will often see artists or photographers capturing the moment. And, and those um, images and, and artworks remind us that we, we have something truly special in our community 
that we really do need to look after um, so that everyone can appreciate um, the, the, the hub that the harbour is. On to the actual activities um, of the FHSA itself, you know, what, what is it that we're doing on a, a daily basis? So there's the operational aspects of, of running the, the harbour and the, the seafront. So Stuart really and myself have taken on the job share role as harbour manager, um, and, and, and we um, have responsibility to, to work with the harbour master to give guidance of what we want Isodian to do in, in order to achieve the aims of the association. So we started off by publishing the website um, and making mooring availability very visible, something that had never been done in the past. There's a, a, a little map of the harbour um, there, the, the, the map here you'll see on the notice board in the harbour office. Um, so that anyone walking along can see if there's an availability, um, they can go online now and apply for a mooring um, and uh, the, the online payments are available now as well. We've also tidied up the, the harbour management rules to create a clearly understandable um, list of um, kind of do's and don'ts for anyone that has a mooring with an escalation path through the association should anybody have a challenge about um, what, what the group have um, agreed is a proper way to run the harbour. The good news is from the survey that was done uh, by, by um, Arch, Arch Henderson, the, the good news is the harbour is not falling down. It sometimes looks like it, but the, the, the survey came back to say that although there are um, voids and there's clear settlement in the harbour, the actual structure was sound. The, the, the recommendation that they made strongly though, they, they gave us a report that was flagged red, amber and green in, in terms of priority. Um, and the, the, the ladders was one of the key things that had to be repaired and we've made good progress, re replace about half the ladders and, and with plans to do the others um, to, to address one of the health and safety issues. And some of the masonry work has been done. Um, but there is a, a need for a longer program of continual maintenance um, to make sure that the, the actual structure of the harbour um, does not decay unnecessarily. There's also the opportunistic kind of things that come along. The, the, the key um, being converted into a nursing home was something that we were quite, quite strongly opposed to. Um, and we, we worked a lot um, with other groups to try to um, retain something that we saw was a public amenity. But unfortunately, as many, many members in this group will know as well, um, the, the, the reporter at uh, the Scottish Government eventually followed the, the letter of the law in terms of planning um, and, and gave, gave um, permission to convert the building home, um, which did go against our wishes, unfortunately. But um, that's kind of water under the bridge now. But it's, it's a flavour of the type of thing that we've been involved in. Um, and then the Muscle River Flood Pre uh, Protection Scheme, as uh, Alan mentioned, is something that we've um, been heavily involved in as well. And I'll talk, about, I'll talk more about that later. Um, but we've, we've also been talking to Connor and his team about what they are intending to do around about the harbour and, and along the seafront. In terms of environmental um, concerns, it's, it's, it's clearly a hot topic and everything from beach cleans and you know, plastic pollution to, to water quality. We've been lobbying SEPA um, in turn to put pressure on Scottish water to, to try and restore the bathing water quality that we once had, but sadly has been lost. It's a major issue um, and, and you know, a PR disaster, frankly, um, to, to have lost that bathing quality. Um, bathing water quality status, but uh, something that we're working hard to try and try and recover. On, on to kind of public consultation. Some years ago, a survey was done by the Waterfront Group, and you know, long story short, out, out to a number of people in the community, do you think the area could be used, used better? Overwhelmingly, the answer came back as, as a yes. The big question though is, what is it that you'd like to see? Um, and there have been a few sketches done, everything from you know, trying to make the, the whole front a bit more boulevard-like um, to operational things in the harbour as well to you know, increase the capacity. So one of the proposals was to install um, pontoon systems to be able to walk on and off boats and also increase capacity in the harbour. So these ideas are all kind of out there. Um, and we've, we've got a, a complete list as an association of all of the things, all of the ideas that have come up with a rough budget against them and the benefits um, that we see along, along with the challenges to try and sort all of that into an order 
so that we can then apply for funding as a as a charitable organisation to, to seek investment in, in the area. One of the things though, more recently, because of lockdown, the number of people who have been coming around the harbour, um, you may have seen this on social media and uh, in the press, is that we want to try and create a, a safe route for pedestrians and families and kind of leisure cyclists to get from one side of the harbour to the other. As it stands today, sadly, if you walk from the west side of the harbour to the east side of the harbour, you cannot do that without coming to face to face with traffic that who um, that's, that's open access. So cars drive up and down the promenade today, they drive in amongst the car parking spaces around about the south side of the harbour um, without probably realising that they're mixing with pedestrians and we, we, we do worry that it's an accident waiting to happen. So we've, we've really prioritised this one. Um, you may have seen the temporary um, barriers that we put out a few weeks ago. They were not ideal, we know that, um, but they um, were what we had available to us at low cost at, at that time. In fact, zero cost, thank you to East Lothian Council. Um, so we, we, we trialled it. Um, unfortunately, a neighbour um, took umbrage and started to throw them aside. The police have thankfully now dealt with that issue, so we, we can uh, move on and uh, continue with the trial to work out um, what works and what doesn't work and get feedback and um, comments from locals and everyone that uses the harbour so that we can move forward to something that's a bit more permanent that we've that, that we have trialled. Longer term, as I mentioned, we've got the, the whole list of ideas. We're consulting um, with, with um, all the groups as we can and then the, the, you know, the clear focus is to try and move those um, ideas into, into implementation. But we mentioned the flood protection scheme, and that has been a massive um, exercise to, to work with Connor and his team to understand the impact that the design will have on the harbour and seafront. It clearly impacts from one end to the other. What we've done so far is um, sit down with Connor um, and his team to, you know, if, if you imagine that scene from 2010, add one metre of sea level rise on top of that, and we've clearly got an issue. Um, and that's you know, clearly what we need to protect against. But what does protection look like and what will the design look like is, is a big question that, um, that we have and one that we've put to the team. And no, no, nobody really knows, but we, we've started to sketch out some of our own ideas. I think Connor has been deliberately um, cautious about the information he's sharing and has, has got to follow due process, but we've kind of been imagining in our own minds okay, add a, add a metre onto sea level, what does that mean? Is it up to the height of that blue railing or is it 1.4 metres or is it 2.2 metres, I think was one of the things in the original design statement. Um, and we don't want to see that, frankly. <laughs> the 2.2 metre wall along the promenade may well protect us from the sea, but it destroys everything that the area has got to offer in terms of um, you know, the ambience of the promenade and so on. And ev even at 1.4 metres, it's not going to suit everyone. Um, you know, if you're in a wheelchair, you won't be able to see over that barrier. So, so this is a big concern for us. And you know, we've started to talk to Connor and the team about other options and say, this, this was a, a photograph taken on a holiday, but the idea of a softer dune along um, the, the, the front um, and, and somehow incorporating like a boardwalk would be, is, is that possible? Can that be included in the design? And those are all the questions that we've been asking so far. And one, one idea is the, the, the thought that we could have a continuation of the John Muir way from the um, Brunston Burn all the way down the, um, the, the West Beach along the promenade and potentially over one of the new bridges that, that Connor's talking about um, putting across the Esk. So to, to go into a bit more detail on that, you know, we've, we've got the, um, I might just get a pointer up here at this point. The existing path comes down um, the Brunson Burn, Burn Walkway. Um, we actually did a bit of digging about it amongst the weeds ourselves, and we've put it to Connor and his team that there is space to get a path through there. If you get permission from Scottish Water, who I think own that premises, the idea of a walkway that's off the road coming round um, behind the, the pumping station onto the, onto the front, and then at the other end, a bridge across the, um, the Esk that continues on around the lagoons into the... Um, you know, all the bird watchers and areas that you go to. That all sounded okay. The one big complication is the harbour. And we're not sure yet whether the defence will include the harbour 
which means somehow walking off the, the mouth of the harbour, or will the defence go around the back of the harbour and essentially leave the harbour exposed to flooding and, and rising sea levels? That is still a big question that's unanswered, and it's, it's one of the key things that we want to, to talk to Connor and his, his team about, as well as what the sea defences will actually look like. Will they be a soft dune? Can we simply you know, plant marram grass and allow a dune to grow and have that as a kind of softer, much more appealing um, uh, you know, implementation than a, than a concrete wall? But thinking more out of the box, have we've we've asked the questions? Has has the engineering team considered something more radical? Like if you if you look at the Cardiff Bay um, uh, barrier, I think you call it, um, could we build a dike further out so we actually protect a water front area, but with a bigger dike? Not saying this is a good idea, but has has the team thought about it and? if we ask those questions, what should we as an association be telling our stakeholder groups? So, so that was another question that we put to Connor and, and the team. And should that extend further? Should we be talking to Portobello as well in Edinburgh and doing something much, much, much bigger? And it, it gets better. You know, there's, there's, we found this online. There's, there's, there's folk out there talking about building a dam across the North Sea. Now, that's clearly a bit radical, but it's, it's the type of question I think we, we all should be asking to really push the boundaries to understand what we're doing and to make sure it is actually the right thing that all options have been considered for the town to make sure that we're protecting what is a you know, tr truly important asset to the community. So that's all I want to say about what we're doing in the association. Um, if you'd like to know more, um, we're always on the lookout for new members who are enthusiastic to, um, to promote what we're doing around about the harbour and seafront. Um, it is an open group. Anyone's welcome to come and join us. Um, and with that, um, I would welcome any questions at this stage before we go on to talk about the Norway trip. And I just say that people should unmute themselves, which they can now do before they want to ask a question. I suppose you have to ask the question, David, is there um, any suggestion as to when this plan might come to fruition? The, the flood protection scheme yes, plan. Yes. Yeah. Um, I can't remember the exact time scale, but I've got five years in my head from one of the early plans that Connor shared at one of our early meetings. It says uh, he, he did have a longer you know, Gantt chart that showed the, the project plan all laid out, and it was in the region of about five years. Mm. Thank you. Uh, David, um, can I ask? How big a blow was the loss of the quay uh, as, as a recreational leisure facility? A lot of us fought really hard to keep that building uh, in, in, in some sort of use that would benefit the, the area and its regeneration. How big a loss was it, do you think, um, to Musselburgh and to the harbour area specifically when that decision was uh, taken by the reporter? Yeah, I don't have exact numbers, but it just goes against the, um, the the whole strategy that we've been working towards about making the harbour you know a public amenity. So you know, for example, if you're a visiting boat that's coming from um, another harbour, the ability to go into a bar and have a have a, a bar supper right next to the harbour, you know, it, it ticked that box. The ability to have functions um, and you know, the leisure centre, the swimming pool, and the gym all gave the community something as an asset it was more than just a um a swimming pool it was, it was, a, it was a, a contribution to the, the overall um act, you know the activity hub that the harbour is it's completely sterilized now as a site that it has no contribution that i can think of to what the harbour and seafront offers uh, you know, so it's a private nursing home where the profits are no doubt hived off outside of the community um which is was really sad to see and as a planner, I can I can say that it was the wrong decision, mm -hmm. and uh, I, I made that point after, after, afterwards. But there we are. The planning system seems to work uh, against local interests and for the benefit of business. The sad, uh, the sad thing, yeah. The sad thing was that um, I, I can't remember who told us. It might have been um, Colin Beatty had said that there is a bill going through to change planning 
I believe, where the, the, the requirements of communities are considered, but as it stands today, it's done purely on historic planning legislation and there is no um, consideration given, unfortunately, to what communities need. So that was a bad timing. Can I ask a question about the pontoon idea? Sure. Hello. Um, would there still be public access, easy public access to the harbour? Because I noticed at New Haven, it's been um, gated, I think, the pontoon set up. Yeah. Um, the, it was still a conceptual design, but I'll just jump back to it quickly. You should be able to see it on the screen. The, the proposal that we drew up, the, the piers would still be completely open access for public um, access. The, the idea would be that um, anyone accessing a boat would have walked down this ramp um, along the pontoon um, and on, on this way, and a, a security gate would be needed yeah. uh, somewhere around about here. Yeah. So, it, so it wouldn't, public access would not be permitted onto the pontoons as, uh, themselves for security reasons, but the piers themselves would still, in that design, um, the piers themselves would still be open access for public. Perfect. Thank you. Can I just ask what demand there is for additional berths in the harbour? Yep. Uh, well, we're full at the moment. Um, we, we've got, I think, one space. And what we did um, early on when we did the, the, the design, this was a few years ago now, we spoke to several other um, harbours around about. So Anstruther, for example, did something similar. And when the pontoons were installed, they filled up. So it, it does seem to be a case of build it and they will come. Um, and, and it does seem to generate new activity that doesn't exist today. And, and is that sort of lo local or is it international? Um, do people come from other countries wanting to birth into Anstruther or these places? Or do not know? An Anstruther, not so much. Port Edgar and places, they, they do. Um, this this proposal would be completely local because the harbour dries out. Um, it, it would be unsuitable for big visiting yachts from Scandinavia and places. Um, they, they would still have to go to deep water marinas. Right, right. Okay, anything else? Yeah. David, David, could I uh, just go back to the physical barriers? Uh, it's really, uh, really difficult to see that anything successful over a longer period of time, given what is forecast by climate change, for there to be really any other option uh, that would be long term viable. Since we had the lagoons uh, filled in, the energy that comes in between the lagoons and the harbour in weather conditions that we have now has increased mm -hmm. and that energy will damage the piers, it will change the sand and uh, yeah. it won't take a metre uh, of water, uh, it'll take a few inches because the, the weather's changing as well, we can already see we've got more uh, if I dare say, warmer, windier, wetter weather than uh, we've experienced before. Um, and being a, a Navy man, um, just in the space of 20 years in some places, um, I've seen extreme damage taking place um, quite, quite viciously, yeah. you know. Yeah. And it really is uh, a difficult one, but that area really needs to be protected. Uh, a lot of low-lying houses and uh, spill over onto roads and things like that. You know? I, I completely agree, Carol, and that's why we started to put forward these more, what seem like more radical ideas, a dike further out. On the face of it, seems like a, a, massive, a massive change to what was proposed, but a, a wall close in is not going to help us if sea levels go up two meters so the ugly thing is is having big boulders or these manufactured concrete blocks um, in the sea which is taking the energy off it yeah. Yeah. it's not 
dealing with the height of the water, which is, yeah. makes it less of a problem, but taking in the energy, it's the energy that's destructive. Yeah. And when you've consolidated it into a short area, this, this particular area, because of the, uh, you know, when I, I was a, a very small kid, that those uh, uh, dikes weren't there uh, at, Le at Levin Hall, and uh, a lot of the energy ran up um, into where the race course is. And now that's going to be concentrated more with more water and weather behind it. Um, it may look really ugly, but um, massive stones and uh, concrete finger things do take a lot of the energy out of it. Maybe just. I'm sorry. Perhaps, perhaps we need a barrier across the fourth, like the Thames, have a fourth barrier. And and that's that that has been suggested. Um, Con Connor did say that early on from North Berwick to Anstruther, and that's one of the that was one of the options that was spoken about, which gave us, which kind of stimulated us to thinking, okay, maybe some something more locally could still be within the scope of the work that we're doing here, but you know the, the North Berwick to Anstruther barrier idea is something that's clearly going to involve Edinburgh and all the other surrounding areas. Um, I, I came to the point of thinking we need to protect Musselburgh until the point where Edinburgh starts to feel the pain, and then at that point we'll do something together. Which maybe sounds yeah, a bit how, uh, selfish, but how are we intending to finance all this? Though, where is the finance for this coming? Scottish government, I believe, forty-two million pounds or whatever it is is coming from Scottish government. But from what you're talking about, forty-two million doesn't seem an awful lot because they've got yeah. the whole side of the river, Esk, etc., to do as well. Or are you talking about forty-two million just for? The seafront? No, that's that's the whole project, including the river ice defences. Mm. Well, it would be a, a great deal cheaper than uh, than building a tunnel between um, uh, Scotland <laughs> and Northern Ireland. You know, don't get all political. <laughs> <laughs> not political. It's not political. It's just common sense. <laughs>